I'm going to be talking this morning on wrong thinking distorts our perceptions of God. Wrong thinking distorts our perceptions of God. I recently was talking to a friend of mine who's active in ministry and shared with me that he was ministering it to a particular young man. And uh, this man was having marital problems and so he was trying to address the young man's personal problems and then as a result, the marital problems. Well, what happened was um, his wife gets born again and he gets baptized with the Holy Spirit. And uh, if you're new and first time visitors, we believe in that here, so we teach it. Um, we've got materials over there that'll help you. If you don't have that experience, I believe that as a believer, you need to have it. That's my personal belief. So feel free. I do. And uh, so he ministered to this, to this fella and gets him born again. It gets him filled with the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, which I believe is the biblical principle. Now, the minute that that happens, the guy says, wow. And my friend said, what's, why wow? He said, I heard a voice speak to me. I said, well, you, you he said, well, you should. <clears throat> because the Holy Spirit now is going to be interacting with you. What did he say? Now, I've got to go back just for a minute and tell you that the biggest problem that this young man had all his life was his father walked out on him and left him. And he grew up with a, a stepfather who probably tried the best that he could. But you know, those blended families are tough to really bring together. But he grew up with this anger towards his father who'd walked out on him. So my friend said to him, what did the Holy Spirit tell you? He said, the Holy Spirit told me, my father never walked out on me. My father didn't know I was born. Because what had happened was, his mother and, and the person who became his father, they'd had a courtship, they'd had sex, and before she knew that she was pregnant, they broke up and split. And she never ever told him that he had a son. So his perception was the father's walked out on me. And he was as angry as all get out. His perception was distorted. He didn't have all the facts. And if he'd had all the facts, he probably would have lived a far happier life the years before he met Jesus than what he did. So I want us to have a look this morning, and we're going to start at Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. You know me, I'm a teacher, I'm going to teach, I'm not going to bounce around much, but I get excited from time to time. I love the Word of God, and I believe that the Word of God is what sets us free. See, the challenge is, behold, I set before you this day, life and death. Blessing and cursing. And in case we're not bright enough, God says, choose blessing. Choose life. But each one of us have to do that for ourselves. Now, as we grow up, and I think some of the most blessed people, really, in the world, are the people who grew up without a lot of spiritual or religious background. Because when new truth comes along, it's easier for them to buy in on it. Those of us who grew up in a church background, kind of, okay, are still influenced many times by the teachings that already we've had and we've been applying in our lives. Even though many of them have not been successful. But we still keep going down that road because that's what I was taught. So I want us to, this morning, just be free in our thinking and let the Spirit of the Lord minister to you if He's going to, because at some stage He is going to. So let's have a look at Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. It says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. See, if you think that you, you cannot do something, you won't. 
doesn't matter how much, I'll never succeed at that, I'll never be, uh, I'll never qualify, I'll never do this, I, I'll be the first to get fired. All that kind of thinking plays on us. And it ends up doing something in our lives that nobody else can do. It provides the parameters, the limits of our lives. We limit ourselves. By our thinking, and your thinking doesn't just stay thinking, your thinking becomes words. And once I've spoken that out of my mouth, I've, I've birthed it, I've set it in motion. I can think it, but I can overcome my thinking, and I can get my thinking changed. But once it's that ingrained that I start speaking it out, especially when the pressure's on, then I find myself in a situation limiting myself. Our problem is... Our thinking is too small concerning ourselves. Forget about being millionaires and all the rest. I'm just talking about what you can accomplish, what you can be in God. God's per God has never created a failure. Never. doesn't matter how many people fail, how many times you fail. God never created a failure. He created the person who is failing in an area, but he's already made a way for that person to come out of that situation if they'll just follow what needs to be done. So we've got the deist. <clears throat> As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And the deist is, uh, most of our founding fathers were deists. I've read it. Uh, they were not born again believers like we understand born again believers to be. They were deists. They acknowledged the fact that there was God. That God was the creator of everything. But a deist's attitude is this. God created it all. Put us in it. Now we have got to make ends meet. We've got to make things happen. We've got to do this. So the onus of, of responsibility for action moves from God, who's done everything, to us. Now, whatever we make of our lives, we're responsible for. That's the deist mindset. The atheist says, I don't believe that there's a God. You know, God doesn't believe in atheists. Yeah, I, I, can't remember, I can't remember who it was, but one of America's great generals um, during the Second World War, he said, I've never seen an atheist in a foxhole. <laughs> when, when all hell's breaking loose on that battlefield, there are people who say, I don't believe in God. They're calling to God. <laughs> Amen. So the, the atheist attitude is, well, there's no God. Therefore, there's no accountability. So I can do whatever I want to do. Um, and we know what the end of that is according to the Bible. If you use the Bible as the basis for your living and your faith. Then we have the believer. And we, the church is filled with unbelieving believing believers. And the big, the big challenge is this. That as I look at it and I listen to people because unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit that way inclined, listening to what they're saying, having a look at where, what their source of information is, I find that the majority of New Testament believers are living out of the Old Testament. Yeah. Now, we're going to talk about the image of God because that's very important, because what is your image of God? How do you see God? You see him as this ogre with a stick that always wants to beat you? This one who's just waiting for you to miss the mark. This one who's ready all the time to trip you up and not let you succeed. Do you see God that way? Well, we need to have a look and see how that image can be changed. What you and I think governs what we say. And what we say sets both the direction of our lives... And its parameters. I'll never have. We'll never be. I'll always be the last one. I'll always be the first one to get fired. We'll always live from hand to mouth. Listen to those statements. And yet you won't find one of them in the word of God. So if I, the, the point is this. That if I change my thinking. I'll change what I say. And thereby change my life. So let's look at some of the, the things that indicate what we think, number one. And number two, the things that limit us and our potential in God. 
God is limited in our lives by our small thinking. Well, was everybody called to be a Billy Graham? Maybe not. But I, I think that as we have a look at ourselves and we take stock uh, of ourselves, we will agree that there's a whole lot more that we could accomplish for the kingdom than we have accomplished. All right, so I don't know who to go. We don't have a choir. I can't preach to the choir. Congregation's gone brain dead on me. <laughs> All right, okay. So here we well, are. Let's have a look at this. Some of the sayings. Uh, saying number one, I've got three of them this morning. Saying number one is this. If the Lord wills. Okay, let's have a look at James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. James four thirteen through 16. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get going. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this and do that. Next verse. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil, or if you want to put it in brackets, is natural. Okay? Now, well, this is what James is saying. That we do not know the details of tomorrow. And therefore, should not make personal plans without consulting God. He's not saying don't make plans. But this is where we run into problems. Because... James is directing his words to believers who are making decisions independently of God. And James reminds us not to do this because decisions that are of any significance without putting them before God as the foundation of our priorities and decisions, we're probably going to make a mess of our lives. Let me give you some illustrations. Having pastor for many many years I've got a whole slew of them but three of them come to mind as I was preparing this how many times and and you know I think I, Joan and I it's, it's a bit of a family joke because when we have people that that come in and they say pastor we've been looking for this church we've been praying for years that God is going to have a church like this in the area we are so thrilled to have found you. Well, number one, we weren't lost. <laughs> but they were looking around, and I understand that. So we've got, you know, we're, we're thrilled to be here. And we see them for about five or six weeks. And we never see them again. What happened to the thrill? There's people who relocate. Well, I don't relocate because there's a better job down the road. I will tell you right now, the enemy will get you a better job or a job with better pay than what you've got in order to move you out of where God wants you to be. Amen. If the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord, and I believe that because the Word of God says that, it means if I'm a believer, God loves me enough to lead me and direct me and bring me to a place where He wants me to be, and that's a geographical location apart from anything else. And I'm to be a saver of life, unto life and death unto death, in that place that he has planted me. Amen. I can't uproot my... Well, I can, but the consequences of, of uprooting yourself is you disconnect yourself from where God wants you to be. God has a divine purpose for each and every one of us. And when I just go along and willy-nilly just say, well, I'm going down the road there. We had a couple many years ago, many years ago, right I think in the first two or three years that the church was in existence. <clears throat> this gal and her sister, they used to clean houses. And somebody brought them uh, in, into, into living faith. And the girl gets born again. And then she gets baptized with the Holy Spirit. And she's turned on. She's married to a, a fellow who is uh, a scientist. And um, he, he got laid off. And there were months that they didn't have income from his side. 
He comes along to the church. I'm not even sure as I'm standing here that he was born again, but let me believe that he was. Because, anyway, point is this, that he applies for a job, and he applies for a job in a remote part of the country, like way down, don't get mad, in Georgia. Okay? <laughs> so they come in and they tell me, which is, the, and I respect the fact that they, they did it, they did it correctly, they set up an appointment, came in and said to me, Pastor, this is what's happening, and uh, uh, we believe, uh, you know, that this is a, a provision of the Lord. I said, how do you know? They said, well, it just looks so good. I said, do you go by what it looks like or do you go by what the sensing in your spirit is? Part of the emphasis that I place here at Living Faith for those that come in is learning to hear, hear the voice of the Spirit of the Lord. He does speak to us. I, I, I hear the Spirit of the Lord right here. Any time I get that, I know, I know it's God. The enemy doesn't speak to my recreated spirit. The Lord speaks to me here. So, uh, they said, oh no, we, we just sort of, we've prayed together. Now, I know how young they were in the Lord. And I can imagine what sort of praying and God honors that. However, I'm not sure that they were hearing what God might have been saying. So I said to them, okay, you're going down to this place. Now, have you been down there? Yes, we went to go and reconnoitre it, and, and uh, it's great. I said, where is, uh, is, there, is, there, is there a good local church? They said, no. They said, we have got to travel, and I can't remember exactly what the amount is, but it was some, like an hour one way, hour and a half one way, and hour and a half one way back to go to church. I said, uh, you're not really going to do that. Oh, yes, we will. Oh, yes, we will. I said, well, you know, you've got to understand, I'm going to pray that the Lord's going to give you wisdom and so on, da-da-da-da-da-da. And uh, we did, and they left. They took their family down there. They traveled probably three or four times because it came back to us that they traveled three or four times. The marriage ran into a mess, broke down. They ended up divorced, out of church, out of everything, out of the will of God. Was that the will of God? Was the Lord leading them? No. Point being, we've got to know the voice of the Lord because He will not lead you by the natural senses. Have a look, here's a great opportunity for me to move. I've, I've moved jobs for money. And I tell you, some of the decisions that I made were terrible. They were not good. You never change a job for money. As a believer, as a believer, you learn to hear the voice of the Spirit. And you, hear, and you do what the Spirit says because when, I, when I'm in the will of God, I know I can rely on Him to keep being the source of everything that I need. doesn't matter how tough things seem to get. So I don't just relocate because I got offered more money down the road. What about, uh, well... I've been here in the church for so long, Pastor, and nobody's recognizing me. What kind of recognition do you want? Because this is another reason that people relocate. They relocate churches. Well, they're much nicer in the other church. They smile more. Um, their music's not so loud. Uh, did God add you here? Now, this is as a principle. Let me help you as a believer. Because this is why we don't have members here. We have partners. People who come into partnership. If the feeling is that, oh man, this is so tough to take, whatever it might be, um, pray change. How about that? Amen. Pray change. Oh, but you know, I've been praying the whole time. How long have you been praying? Well, you know, I started about four years ago saying, oh God, I don't know if I really want to be here. That's not the issue. Do you want to be here? God may have put you in your church. And if you're visiting with us, God bless you. Thank you for being here. I'm not talking to you. But I'm talking to you about your church. Because if God put you in that church and you're visiting, that's one thing. But you go back to your church because that's where God planted you. God wants you to grow where he's planted you. The person sitting next to you is going to be some of the best Holy Spirit sandpaper you're ever going to meet. Don't tell me the Christian life is easy. It's not. Hey, hey, hey. 
The Lord gave this to me yesterday as I was writing this. You cannot get off first base in your faith praying with, if it be your will. 1 John chapter 5 verses 14 and 15. 1 John chapter 5 verses 14 and 15. We need to understand God has provided for us the means whereby we can know His will. This is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So that means I have to know what the will of God is. He's not hiding it from me. See? But I've got to go along and I've got to learn how to hear the voice of the Spirit, know what the Scriptures say, and understand that God loves me peculiarly. Because I'm a peculiar person. That was a good opportunity to say amen. You know. <clears throat> and if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we, watch this, have the petitions that we desired of Him. Now, if your desire is outside of the will of God, you will know it. Right here. You will know it. Don't try and fiddle with God. You... You, you, can't, you can't negotiate with him. Well, God, if you'll just give me that, then I promise you I'll do this. God doesn't need your doing. He can get somebody else who will do it with the right attitude of heart. Amen? God's wanting you to make him the, the, the source of your leading, your guiding, your provision. Amen? All right, because if you want to prosper, that's the way to do it. You can't prosper outside of God. You can have great ideas, but I'll tell you, you'll never prosper outside of God as much as you will in God. So if I don't know God's will in a matter, I've got to learn it. I've got to find out what it is. How do I do that? I go to the Word of God. You see, the, every time that we sit and we, we break the Word open over here, he can speak to you from the word that's being ministered from the platform. He can speak to you from the word that you're reading there and your iPad. See, uh, he can speak to you in your spirit. He can speak to you spirit to spirit in praise and worship. There's so many ways that God speaks to us. We've just got to stay sensitive to his voice. Now, I know... That the sons and the daughters of God are to be led by the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. And that word sons there is, is the word huios. H-U-I-O-S in the Greek. And it's the adult sons. Those who've grown up. There is, there is a time in the body of Christ just like it is in a natural family. Where you've got babies and the older kids look after the babies. And as they grow their, so their diets change and various other things take place in order to facilitate growth. But as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. They are the adult sons. That's what the Greek says. Adult sons. Those who are, can be given responsibility and they're going to discharge that responsibility before God. The end result of this is that there are many things I don't have to pray about. We've got to come to a place where in our lives there are things that are already settled deals. Doesn't matter what I go through. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I have to, for myself, all right, individually, things that need to be settled are, hey, I know who I am. I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a believer and I'm in Christ. And in Christ, I live and move and have my being. And that verse goes to the very core of what we're talking about, to the issue of what we're talking about. And that is acknowledging God as the source of everything. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. You do not belong to yourself. Jesus bought you. Therefore, he wants to live his life through you in order to touch other people. How available are you? How available am I? Every one of us wants blessing. But what I've got to do, things that I don't uh, have to pray about are clearly outlined to me in the word of God. Jesus purchased them through his death, resurrection, 
and his ascension. Don't forget the ascension. Because in the ascension, you and I are seated together with him in heavenly places. Do you see yourself that way? In every circumstance. Not in eternity. Because you're living eternity now. If you were to drop dead this very minute, you'd walk into where you are. If you're outside of Christ, you'll spend eternity outside of Christ. I believe that's the teaching of the Bible. If you're a believer and you're in Christ, you already, according to Ephesians, are seated together with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what it says. So I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm seated at the right hand, the position of authority, power, and the ability of God. We've got to remember that. And those things, I don't even have to go and pray, oh God, give me more power. He'll give you all the power. You've been given all the power that you need to be able to get your job done. Whatever your race is, and your race is different to mine, but the point is this. Whatever it is that you're needing, whatever it is I'm needing, it already has been provided for me. Can I be a better father? Can I be a better mother? Can I be a better child? Don't forget, children also got to get better. I think so anyways. All right, let me give you... Um, <clears throat> Let me give you, very quickly, the second one because we're going to be running short of time. The second saying that um, produces wrong thinking and it distorts our perception of God is this. Romans chapter 8, 26 through 29. And it's this. All things work together for good. Now, I don't know whether you've heard that statement, all things work together for good. Uh, many times it's just left like that. But that's not what the Word of God says. Put it up there again, please, would you? Thank you. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. Uh, the word infirmities is not sickness. The word infirmities is the Greek word for limitations. You and I are human. We've got limitations. I don't know everything that's going on in your life. I don't need to know. I've got enough hassle handling the stuff that goes on in my life. But watch this. He takes hold together with us against. What is the Holy Spirit wanting to do? He's wanting to take us to a place where we can go along and can, we can facilitate change. Okay? So how is, how is he going to do that? He takes hold together. And the picture there in the Greek is if we've got a tug of war, we've got a team over there pulling in that direction, we're pulling against that team. The Holy Spirit comes along in the Greek and takes hold of the rope together with us and helps pull in order to get His will done. Okay? So, let's go back to the verse. He helps our limitations. And then He tells us what the limitations are. For we don't know... What we should pray for as we ought to pray. But the Spirit himself, the Spirit's not an it, it's a him, makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Next verse. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Sounds like a lot of stuff. I'm going to tell you what it is in a minute. What it, what it means. And we know, watch this now, that all things work together. For good. Now they, 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 they take that one little phrase over there and they haven't even finished it. To them that love God has got to be added in. Yeah. All things do not work together for good. Amen. To them who are called according to his purpose. So when do all things work together for good? Number one, I've got to love him. And I don't mean, oh, I love you, Jesus. I mean, love him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We, we, we are so presumptuous. We go before God expecting God just to produce for us because we say so. When most Christians go into a prayer meeting, whether it's a personal or whether it's a general prayer meeting, they go in with a shopping list. I'm shopping. God doesn't want you to shop many times. God wants to sit you down and talk to you about invariably you. See? So when, when we get together, here we are in a particular situation. The Holy Spirit takes hold together with me against that problem. I move into the office and what do I find? There's mayhem. There's chaos. Something's wrong. God's not in that. 
So now how do I change that? But, uh, well, Pastor, how can I change it? I'm the only believer there. What? I, I don't know, somewhere along the line, I seem to remember that one with God is the majority. I seem to remember 1 John 4, 4 that says, Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. I know of people sitting in this congregation who've gone along and they've spoken to businesses that were failing and turned the business around. The Word of God says that where two of us agree. But even then, I don't need to. All I need to have is an understanding of what I'm dealing with. So when I... When I uh, the Holy Spirit knows what the need is. Have a look there. Just go back, go, go back there to that first verse, please. Thank you. We know that another verse before that is 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps our limitations. And my limitation in a given situation. Father, I'm available to you. You can call on me at any time, Jesus. I'm your man. I'm your woman. He says, ah. Oh. Okay. So now we've got somebody in the church in China. And they're crying out, that's the Chinese for calling out to God. Okay, please, I'm not, but I'm just giving you an idea. Okay, so they call out to God. And God hears them. God's not limited by time and distance, all right? So they're calling and they're 14 hours ahead of us. God hears the call. He says, oh, I remember I was, I was there at Living Faith on Sunday. When I had those people stand up and say they would be available to me, I'm going to just go along and call on one of them because I really need their availability right now. Bang! Now you say, well, hang on a minute. That guy is calling God. Why is it that God has to go along and get somebody else involved? Because God wants you involved in ministry. You made yourself available. Well, that's presumptuous. He should give me a sort of heads up on this deal. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning is the heads up. I promise you. It happens all the time. It's quite amazing. So, um, you get down and now you know the nudge of the Lord. You know he's nudged you. Lord, what for? Fellowship? No. Uh, you want me to go along and soak? No. So, I don't know what it's about. I don't know who it's about. I don't know the circumstances. I don't know where they are. How am I going to deal with the situation? Through the baptism with the Holy Spirit. That scripture tells me the Spirit knows the hearts of all men. The Spirit knows the mind of God. And the Spirit is leading me and guiding me in what, in what I need to pray. When it gets to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, my spirit... Again, the Greek, by the Holy Spirit in me. Praise. That's good. You say, what does it mean? Got no idea, but boy, it felt good. Yeah. See, we've got to realize this. I'm a spirit being, available to God. And when the Holy Spirit comes on me, all he's got to do is nudge. I don't have to know the reason, and I may in this world never, ever, have insight as to what we prayed about. But I think the day is going to come one day when we're no longer here. Somebody's going to walk up to you and say, are you Jerry Jackson? Jesus said that you were. And he doesn't lie, so you must be Jerry Jackson. Do you remember? Da -da 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 yeah. I was the person that you were praying for because I called out to God and I needed God to intervene in a situation where I needed somebody that he could rely on who would jump into the gap and would ensure that there was a reinforcing of my faith. That's what that's about. All things do not work together for good. Period. All things work together for good for those that are called of the Lord. See? You and I, if all things work together for good, then we've got a problem. And the problem that we've got is you're going to have a problem trying to resist the devil if all things that 
happen work together for good. So the devil comes against you and you're supposed to, according to James 4, 7, resist him and he will flee from you. But you, now you don't know whether this is God sending this thing into your life. Hmm. And Romans 8.28 that we read tells us that God can turn messes into triumphs. Don't become passive and just let life happen, thinking that everything will work out for the good. No. You and I have got to learn to be confident and aggressive in our praying, knowing what is ours. Mark 11.24 Therefore, what things soever you desire. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. You've got to know what is yours. You've got to know, don't, don't fall into this trap of these religious cliches that get thrown around. We'll talk a little bit more next week about some of them. But you've got to realize these things are thrown out there by the enemy and too many Christians just grab onto it. Well, all things work together for good. And you're getting the tar knocked out of you. You should be standing there drawing, drawing a line in the sand and saying, Devil, you cross that line once more. I'm going to smack you so hard. I'll smack you into last year. You don't put him into next year. You put him into last year. See? Did you get something out of this this morning? Amen. Praise God. <clears throat> take, take the hand of the person next to you, would you? Father, we want to give you thanks this morning for your word. We bless you. We ask that by your spirit you, you seal on the inside of us that which we need. Because we're a people who are in need. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. We need your understanding. We need your strength. We want to thank you, however, that all of that is available to us. And we receive it by faith and we thank you for it. We pray for this person whose hand we're holding. We ask you to bless them real good this week. In Jesus' name, amen.